steadfast love is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. For your steadfast love is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. Oh God, you are my God, eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Therefore I have gazed upon you in your holy place, that I might behold steadfast love is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So I will bless you as long as I live and lift up my hands in your name. For your steadfast love is better spirit is content as with the richest of foods and my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches for you have been my help and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My whole being clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. For your steadfast love is better than life itself. Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory. Glory to you, O Lord. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. <coughs> then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it, but found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? The gardener replied, 
Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, then you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Isaiah asks. Why? Why do you spend your labor for that which does not satisfy? Isaiah, as usual, is on point here, I think. Why do we spend our money for things that which are not bread, or our labor for things that do not satisfy us? I don't have a great answer uh, for this today. Um, But perhaps there's something in the movement here, something in the movement from from a life of of wealth and time spent on things that leave us wanting more to recognizing this way of God that seeks to meet the needs of all people as this vision is laid out by Isaiah. And I think this kind of movement might be helpful for us today in the way that we think about what repentance means. As has been the case for a few weeks now, um, as we continue to have as a part, for, as a part of our Lenten journey, uh, we've had uh, these scripture stories, interesting juxtapositions of scripture readings before us in our worship together. And today we begin with Isaiah's beautiful words, both of challenge and of promise, putting forth this evocative vision of abundance where none go hungry, where none are thirsty, that is then balanced with the song of the psalmist who testifies to God's love, singing things like, oh God, you are my God. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. Your steadfast love is better than life itself. And yet as we have Isaiah portraying a world where the physical needs of humanity are met, paired then with the psalmist's testimony of a God who meets the spiritual needs of the people. We then also have this gospel reading for today from Luke, which at first blush seems much less hopeful and much less joyful than the artistry that Isaiah and the psalmist put forth today. For as we hear from Luke, we have this interesting exchange between Jesus and these folks in the crowd around him as they're trying to make sense of tragedy in their world. Remember when Pontius Pilate mixed the blood of the dead Galileans with the Roman sacrifices, they ponder? I mean, this had been a particularly brutal show of Roman imperial power, communicating something to the effect of, well, if if you Jews won't worship our Roman gods when you're alive, we'll at least make sure that you worship them when you're dead as we use your blood in our rituals. And as they reflect, trying to wrap their heads around how something like this could happen to their fellow people, their their go-to wisdom of the day would suggest that these, these Galileans who experienced this demeaning, disrespectful display of dominance must have done something to deserve it. But Jesus swiftly deconstructs this notion as he clearly lays out that these were by no means any worse sinners than any other Galileans. Jesus then even brings up a second story to further illustrate his point. Remember when those 18 were killed, when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Well, guess what, people? Uh, They also did nothing to deserve such a death. Tragedies happen. They're they're not a result of some particular sin. They're not a result of some sort of divine judgment or punishment. And so Jesus begins to help these people around him understand that the God is not in the business of doling out divine punishments to match bad human behaviors. No, that's, that's not the way God works, it seems. So Jesus 
all of a sudden it's turning their whole concept of who God is and what God is about upside down. And then goes even further into it with this parable that describes God in a very different role than that which might have been expected at the time. The parable he shares is this, right? The parable of the fig tree. He says, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, but uh, he came looking for fruit on it and found that there was no fruit. So he says to the gardener, see here, for three years I've been waiting for fruit on this tree and still there isn't any. So please, Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? But the gardener replies and says, Sir, let it alone. One more year. Let me dig around it. Let me put manure on it. If it bears fruit, great. If it doesn't bear fruit after that, then fine. You can cut it down. And initially, based on this former understanding of God as the the one of divine punishment, that kind of perspective, it might uh, be tempting to cast God as the, the angry vineyard owner in this parable, right? The one who's furious that the fig tree is barren. But if we think of what Jesus is illuminating here with this reinterpretation of, of who God is and what God is about, it, it seems that perhaps Jesus is aligning God with the character of the gardener, perhaps, in the parable. Giving God an infinitely more compassionate identity, revealing that God is actually one who seeks to nurture the tree and who seeks to nurture the people, I think, especially when our world demands productivity that we cannot provide or tells us that we're not worth anything because we don't produce enough. And so as Jesus deconstructs this lifeless image of God they have before them, he also begins to reconstruct a life-giving image of God. As he then lifts up this image of of God who is nurturing and caring, who seeks to come alongside when death is close at hand, who seeks to provide all the necessary circumstances for life to flourish abundantly, And I wonder if, as he's lifting up this image, I wonder if if this movement, this deconstruction and reconstruction, paralleling that kind of Isaiah's movement, I wonder if that's part of what Jesus is getting at when he's calling for repentance here. Repentance initially, that's maybe a movement towards an understanding, right, of God as life-giving, as tending, as this caring gardener, but Maybe also then a repentance that's a movement towards a life-giving way of living. A way that might be embodied by God's people, by us, that, that seeks to make room for this abundant and compassionate and caring love of God to be made known broadly in our midst. For changing ways of thinking lead to changing ways of living, I think. And repentance in our minds leads to an embodied repentance that might be lived out day to day in our lives. And as we continue to more deeply understand ourselves as as partners with God in the revealing of this abundance for all, I, I think this movement, this repentance, this shift, I think it aligns strongly with the rest of our whole Lenten journey that we're on, as God continues to draw us more deeply into the disciplines of this season, maybe even this discipline of repentance, that somehow we might be moved to turn away from all the lifeless things that do not satisfy, that do not fill us, and that we might turn towards something that leads us into a more abundant way of life for all. And honestly, I'm not exactly sure what that looks like. But perhaps it might begin with something like a critical eye towards our broader community. Perhaps looking uh, further upstream and further downstream, both at the supply chains that provide us with all these things we consume, but also that endless series of waste behind us that we leave in our wake. Perhaps it means 
looking at some of our behaviors, the way we live. Maybe, maybe perhaps it, uh, it means changing something that we're doing. Maybe this will be difficult for us. And maybe we'll continue to ask right with Isaiah. We'll say, why? Why do we do this? Why do we spend our money and our, our labor for that which does not satisfy and fill us? But maybe this question will continue to lead us more deeply into the mystery of how God's divine presence brings about this kingdom of God into our world. And maybe these questions will continue to open us to the way that God will continue to work in us. And maybe these questions will continue to move us even further into this life-giving repentance, both of mind and body, that God's kingdom might be further revealed in our world. And so for these questions, and for the revelations they might bring, I give thanks. And may God continue to bring forth such seeds as we ponder what it means to walk this Lenten journey together. May God continue to be with us in this way. Amen.